Let's take a look now at a little bit more of the history of computers and specifically information storage and how computer circuitry eventually was miniaturized through a series of improvements in the 1960s and 1970s to result in the small computers we have today. On page 41 you see the representation of a punched card. For almost a hundred years this was a very common form of information storage dealing with mainframe computers. A paper card about the size of, of a dollar bill, perhaps a little bit larger, into which were punched square holes up to 80 columns worth. The printing you see on the card just identifies different rows on it, different patterns of holes, not in the ASCII binary code, but in a different representational scheme. Different patterns of holes would stand for different letters or numbers in each column, and the meaning of the whole pattern in a given column was often printed at the top with small letters so that the card could be read by people as well as by machines. This was invented in the 1890s and it helped in the 1890 census and, and became popular for a number of businesses to store accounting information that could be manipulated mechanically. Devices that used electricity with small wire fingers that might drop through the holes could sense the whole pattern and various types of electrical circuits could then do things with the information including in a way adding them up by by notching a pointer like a clock face further along to point to one number higher every time a given piece of data was encountered a crude way of tabulating things but much faster than working over data by hand so this was a big improvement in the 1890s and onward when IBM first built its mainframe computers, it oriented them to receive information in this way. IBM already had a very large business in punch card equipment by the 1940s and 1950s, and it really sought to capitalize on that by making their mainframes deal with information in this format. Some of the earliest programming languages, COBOL and FORTRAN, for example, were oriented to being coded on 80-column cards. An interesting thing happened as computer circuitry was miniaturized in the 1960s, making it possible to have smaller computers than mainframes, such as this mini computer. Mini computers, just as the name would imply, were smaller computers made possible by the miniaturization of various types of circuitry, memory and the central processing unit, the kinds of gates assembled to create the thinking part of the computer. You see here a picture of a digital equipment corporation, PDP-7. This was an early model of a deck, was later bought by another company as many computer fortunes declined with the advent of even smaller computers, the kind of computers that we're familiar with today, personal computers running Windows and Apple Macs. These early mini computers were programmed in a different way. People didn't use punch cards to feed into these because the manufacturers of these had no vested interest in the punch card industry, unlike IBM. This device you see here is a teletype. It's really sort of a typewriter that has the ability to output electrical signals, a different signal for each one of the keys that are pressed. So you might think about this device, a teletype, very similar to the way that you regard a keyboard today. A keyboard on a computer does pretty much the same thing. These signals coming out of here would be captured in memory. The person typing on this might actually be typing a program and storing in memory program statements in a language like BASIC. Eventually, this caught on with the idea that why not actually type information this way and store it in memory? And it wasn't too long before people started thinking, why can't I write documents this way? store them in memory, and then perhaps even have a program, which was eventually called a word processor, to manipulate those words, and this might replace then manual typing with a way that would be much more dynamic. So we take this for granted these days that we have word processors like Word, which really are programs that run in small computers. The idea came about here when this form of information interface to a computer became much more commonplace replacing punch cards, which really have gone by the boards now. I can't imagine anybody in this day and age would be recording information in this way, although it is still a viable way to do things. It's just very uneconomical given other technologies that are now available. Now I've included on these pages various hyperlinks so that you can look up things if you're particularly interested in one topic or another. It isn't required that you follow these hyperlinks, but you might find them interesting 
if you have an interest in one particular topic or another. This hyperlink, for example, will give you information about word processors expanding on the history that I just mentioned. Let's take a look on page 43, considering a topic of office automation software. This is the generic name for things like word processors, the Excel spreadsheet, uh, Access Database, PowerPoint, otherwise sometimes called personal productivity tools. In the Wild West days of microcomputers, when chips were first adapted to making small computers instead of being components in larger computers, that era from around 1976 to 83 was the very early days. Many manufacturers existed in that time period that you wouldn't even hear about anymore because they came and went, just as when the automobile was first invented, an awful lot of different types of cars existed, and most manufacturers dropped by the wayside as technology fleshed itself out and settled on a few particular approaches. What you see here is the first type of microcomputer commonly available, this one by a company named MITS, which had already been manufacturing some types of electronic devices and saw the possibility of adapting then available computer chips and memory chips to make a small machine. This was essentially a hobbyist machine, very crude forms of programming, very crude way to enter information in and out, but enthusiasts got very jazzed by this sort of availability. And this might cost a few hundred dollars. This on the left is the very first type of an Apple computer called Apple One. Two entrepreneurial types, Stephen Jobs and Stephen Wozniak, paired up in the late 70s. Wozniak a genius when it comes to developing circuitry and economizing on the printed circuit boards necessary to support it, was a key person in developing this as kind of a hobby computer. But of course we all know where that went. Steve Jobs in a very entrepreneurial way was able to build a company out of this and the pair of them became billionaires in manufacturing this type of computer. Apple has had kind of an interesting history. It suffered declines in the 80s and 90s with a product line that was too diverse and kind of a lack of direction when the board of directors of the firm ousted Jobs. Jobs later came back and whipped the company into shape and made it into the success it is today with machinery that shows fantastic genius in design and style and presents a real competitor to the Windows environment which is based on a different form of computer architecture. We actually see in the computer marketplace Windows PCs and Apple microcomputers, Apple Macs, pretty much as we see in the automobile line, Fords compared to the Mercedes and the BMWs. You can decide for yourself which type of car matches which kind of computer. If you click here on this hyperlink, you'll see a very interesting clip from a movie named The Triumph of the Nerds. This is a really interesting clip that doesn't last much more than seven minutes, but it will show you some of the personalities involved in the early days of computers, and they're still around today, very wealthy people. This documentary gives you a really great idea of what it was like in the early days of microcomputing and how microcomputers really took over the world as far as people's conception of what computers were and what they could do. One of the people leading this revolution is Dan Bricklin, who invented a program way back in the 1970s to make a very unique use of an Apple II computer. He called this program VisiCalc, and it really was the first spreadsheet that was practical on microcomputers. That uh, program later turned into Excel, not that VisiCalc itself was the code that became Excel, but once the concept caught on, Microsoft invented something along similar lines and coded it up and called it Excel. The thing that was unique about this was you could do computations without having to be a programmer. That is, you could plug formulas into cells in a grid, and those formulas would involve other cells by address, the row and column address of the other cells, and then these formulas would produce results in the cell in which you put them. Later on in this course you'll have the opportunity to play with Excel and learn more about it. You might already know something about it. There are some features of it that kind of go beyond what people may initially play with. One of them called macros is a way of encoding 
that is capturing the keystrokes that you might accomplish on a repetitive basis and the actual use of spreadsheets for computational purposes in business is something that we explore in yet another project in Unit 4. More about that to come down the pike. Let's take a look at page 44 at this point though. There is a class of computers called supercomputers which are far different from the kind of computers that we deal with either mainframes in the traditional sense or PCs. You're perhaps familiar with the fact that modern small computers have two cores. The use of core is kind of a funny word for that. What it really means is two central processing units. That is two of those brainy part of the circuitry that constitutes a computer. When we talk about supercomputers, we talk about computers that have thousands of these CPUs, these central processing units. Supercomputers are designed for a very specific purpose, and that is to do mathematical types of problems in which the computations can be broken down and separated so that multiple CPUs can be each working on the problem or a portion of the problem at the same time. Not all types of processing are susceptible to this sort of breaking down. In fact, think about it this way. If you wanted to build a roadway very quickly and it was 10 miles long, you could employ 10 different companies each to pave one mile of it. The only thing you'd have to worry about is keeping them separate so they don't run into each other and then making sure that where the work of one company ends on a mile long stretch and the work of another begins that it actually fits together well. There isn't some sort of a big bump there. But you could get the roadway done ten times as fast by hiring ten companies to do the paving, each doing one mile, instead of one company to try and pave all ten miles. But what about if you're running a zoo and you realize it takes 22 months from conception to delivery for an elephant to have a little baby elephant. Could you speed that 22 months process up by assigning three elephants to do the work so that you might have a baby elephant in just seven months? I don't think so. That kind of task is not receptive to being split up among different workers. And that's the difference in the kinds of processing tasks that supercomputers can approach. If it's like the roadway, then you can split the processing task up into multiple parts and get the result faster by having each processor do a part of the work. But if it's like having a baby elephant, then the process can't be split up and supercomputers really wouldn't do you very much good. One of the kinds of things that supercomputers are good for is in mathematical modeling or simulating weather. If you're looking on page 45 now, real physical systems like weather simulation can be broken down into parts because you can divide the atmosphere into imaginary cells, perhaps cubes with a side equal to one mile. And if you can model what's happening in that cell independently of other cells, then you could apply a supercomputer to the process of computing this mathematical model to perhaps predict the weather. This is kind of important because if you can speed up that prediction process with the mathematical model so that you can actually make a prediction before that point in time arrives, then your prediction might have some purpose. But if it takes three days for you to simulate what's going to happen in the next 12 hours, by the time you get to the result, you won't be making a prediction. You'll be saying what you thought might have happened in the past. This is a case where mathematical models are very useful and where supercomputers could be applied to the process so that we can actually arrive at a prediction rather than a statement of history. Another task that's susceptible to mathematical modeling using supercomputers is nuclear explosion modeling. Many times now, instead of actually constructing a nuclear device and exploding it either in the atmosphere or underground, it's possible to model the process that goes on at the subatomic level to create the nuclear explosion, but the calculations to do this are so voluminous and so complex that if you used an ordinary computer it might take months in order to do the calculation, but a supercomputer could split that task up and arrive at the answer perhaps in a few hours. So in these ways these very specialized tasks are receptive to being handled by supercomputers. If you look on page 46 there's another type of application of computers even just computers of the ordinary type. And this is geoprocessing. 
what happens here is that information that's associated with geography can be combined with data that's obtained of a more administrative variety such as population or census data and it's thereby possible to combine some of these characteristics of geography with some of the characteristics of ordinary data. Another form of geoprocessing is actually picturing geography using a computer. And a very good example of this is what Google Earth does with its satellite photos, tying that data to other kinds of things like locations on Earth by city name or population characteristics. This is really great for marketing purposes where people who have an interest in citing for example, a Starbucks or some other kind of commercial facility want to place it in areas geographically where the population has certain characteristics. And this is also an application of geoprocessing. Geoprocessing doesn't require supercomputers. Ordinarily, this type of processing uh, was done even with old mainframes rather successfully by combining technologies such as you see described on page 46 provided by the Census Bureau with data that might have been accumulated by an organization in the ordinary course of its work. What I've given you on these two pages, page 45 and 46, is a lot of links that you'll notice are represented in the traditional form, just an underlined collection of words, click here, click here, and various underlined words on page 46. The intention here is that you really can pursue these in order to learn more about various topics if you're interested in them. For example, if you click here, to learn more about careers in meteorology, you'll be taken to a page that I've researched and investigated to tell you a little bit more about that. If you click this one, you'll get to a rather involved article on nuclear explosion monitoring. This one actually is rather technical, and unless you're very interested in that topic, you're not likely to enjoy this article. It's not required reading. I just provide these so that you can explore various things such as applications of computers to things like weather and nuclear modeling if you're interested in that topic. In the same way, on page 46 and subsequent pages, I give you these kinds of hyperlinks to learn more about devices, in this case plotters, that can be used to make very large graphic outputs from geographical data or information about remote sensing, which involves the use of satellites to acquire photographic images of Earth, and then combine that with geographical locators or other types of data, much the same way that Google Earth has made use of these satellite photos to make some rather interesting applications on computers. And you can pursue the remainder of these. They all exist not as required reading, but these links are here so that you can pursue whatever interest you might have in various specialized topics. If we look at page 47, here's yet another use of a special kind of computer that you probably are not very familiar with. This and the next couple of pages leading up to the projects for Unit 2 talk about embedded computers. These are very specialized devices for very special applications. For example, an embedded computer, in fact multiple embedded computers are used in airplanes, to process signals from sensors that indicate the position of the airplane and its attitude, that is, the way that it's leaning one way or the other. And the signals from these sensors are processed by a computer very rapidly to alter some of the control surfaces, that is, to give signals to devices that can change the flaps on the wings to compensate for the plane veering in one direction or jiggling up and down, for example, in bad weather. This is called fly-by-wire because it places the embedded computer between the pilot and the control surfaces. You might think that actually if you picture what a pilot's doing, he's pushing on this control stick forward to make the airplane go down or turning it one way or another like the steering wheel of a car. Actually, in fly-by-wire, the pilot's input by those motions is just one input to a computer that's deciding how to set the flaps and the other parts of the airplane's control mechanisms, how to set them to gain the effect that the pilot indicated that he or she wanted. This is how autopilots work. This is also how devices such as the mechanism in a car equipped with cruise control works. An embedded computer is comparing two things. That is the speed that the car is actually moving and the speed that the cruise control indicates you want the car to go. 
it seeks to maintain an equilibrium between these and if the speed declines relative to what's indicated as desired then the computer sends a signal to the engine to speed up and vice versa if the car is measured to be moving faster than the cruise control indicates it should then the computer sends signals to the engine to slow down a bit these are very interesting applications involving what's known as a servo mechanism that is the machine measuring something about itself and deciding then to change the way it operates to meet some specified criteria you can learn more about servo mechanisms by clicking these two hyperlinks within the reading now I wanted to give you an application just to challenge your thinking a bit here about the use of embedded computers and in this case there's a subtlety involved think about this there's a satellite that we're sending from here to Mars it has panels on it that generate electricity this is a renewable resource as far as the satellite is concerned because if those panels are pointed flat on to the Sun they can generate electricity they'll generate electricity even if they're not pointed flat onto the Sun for example sloping this way but they won't produce as much electricity so our interest is in keeping the satellites panels positioned straight on to the Sun however the satellite is moving the Sun is moving and this demands some constant attention to the positioning of the satellite now here's one of the subtleties involved in this what are you going to use to actually move the position of the satellite in space what people ordinarily think about is some sort of a jet that might be provided with some supply of gas and this jet if you squirt some gas out of the jet will tend to push the satellite in the opposite direction well you could use this mechanism but think about this the gas that you take on board is going to consume some of the energy necessary to put the spacecraft in flight it has weight plus even worse the gas is expendable once you're out of gas you don't have the ability to position the satellite anymore not a good idea you want to think about using the renewable resource on the satellite namely electric power that can be generated by those solar panels to position the satellite but how do you do this there's nothing to push against that is the satellite is moving freely in open space how do you actually generate the force to move it what is that force going to push against well it turns out a very interesting way of doing this is using a flywheel if you've ever held an electric drill and pushed the button to turn it on you'll realize it kicks back that's because in starting to turn the shaft the inertia of the device wants to maintain its present position and a, an opposite force is generated and that's why the drill will kick back in your hand and turn in the opposite direction this is actually what's used in satellites to physically reposition them and since the driving force is electric power it's possible to maintain this kind of control over the satellite even when it's far out in space if it can generate electricity even after any type of fuel we might have placed on board would have long been expended well that's kind of a complicated explanation here of what's going on with the satellite but the idea here is if you look on page 49 we can sense the position of the panels whether they're facing the Sun or not with a simple detector like this that when it's head onto the Sun the little solar cells on either side of this small pyramid will generate equal amounts of electricity but when it's not pointed face onto the Sun then the amounts of electricity generated by these little photo cells represented by dots will be different and this measurement of the values here of the amount of electricity being generated by these two cells is the input to the embedded computer on the spacecraft that then sends a signal an appropriate signal to flywheels on board to change their rotation just a bit in order to generate that kickback force that will move the satellite repositioning those panels this is a servo mechanism the machine is measuring itself and it's taking actions through the embedded computer to change and maintain an equilibrium with some other circumstance in this case the position of the panels facing the Sun this is really interesting stuff this gets into mechanical engineering and electronic engineering and you can click this link if you want more information on that careers for example in aerospace engineering 
and employment information for those kinds of careers. Let me give you a brief run through of the projects you can choose from for Unit 2. Once again, you can choose two projects here on your own. There's no requirement to do any particular ones. You want to choose two that you're interested in, and you can do a third one of your own choice if you want to earn some extra credit. The first of these has a number of hyperlinks in it to help you along in developing a technology timeline. Read through this and you'll see that what I'm asking you to do is to come up with a PowerPoint presentation on which you draw a horizontal line across multiple slides and you mark that off with dates for the century that began in 1900. And you put facts on here according to these instructions that led up to the development of computers. There are a number of hyperlinks I've given you here that will help you in doing this. However, I've noticed one or two of them have become inaccessible. This one is fine for Charles Babbage, but this one on another pioneer in of some of the concepts that led up to the development of computers has actually gone bad. What's happening here is that some place on the web is intercepting my request for this address and it's putting up some other stuff that it hopes I'm going to click on. This is rather deceptive. This georgebool.net used to be a site that would provide information about George Bull. But now, since this address apparently went bad, maybe it expired, somebody didn't renew the name as far as registration goes for that URL. Now, this is not so good. There's nothing to do with George Bull and bankruptcy or DUI lawyers or anything else. This is kind of a deceptive sort of a site that if you fall into, what they're hoping you're going to do is to click something that they're directing you to in the way of advertising. So if this happens with any of the links that I've given you, just ignore it and get out of there because it isn't my intention to direct you to sites that are going to try and sell you anything. Technology Timeline is an interesting project. could give you an overview that wraps up a lot of what you've seen in the required viewings for this unit. PowerPoint as an easel is a really interesting project that I'd encourage you to do if you want to learn something that's going to be useful later in the course. Here's a short video that I created and placed on YouTube that talks about what this project involves. Now the important thing about this video is you seeing the example of what can be done with images in slides. Now the important thing about this example is not exactly what the title indicates. It is interesting to apply audio narration to slides, but that's not quite what I had in mind for illustrating this particular project. Here, however, you see several illustrations on the screen. That is, several images that I've kind of arranged in the form of a collage. That's the example that I wanted to show you here. Using PowerPoint as an easel, you can actually create what artists would call a collage. That is, a combination of other images. You can size those images by grabbing them by the corner and moving diagonally on a given image. If you do this, you can also arrange the pictures, overlapping perhaps, sizing them differently. And as this project will show you, you can then save the image that you've created as one single picture file in the format of a JPEG. That image then is only about a thousand pixels wide and perhaps three quarters of that high. That's a fine way to combine a lot of pictures and then create one emailable picture of appropriate size. Ordinarily, when you take pictures with a digital camera, the resolutions available in today's cameras produce pictures that are many, many millions of pixels in content. And what if you displayed them on a computer screen be poster size? You'd only see a small portion of it on a computer screen. Using this technique of PowerPoint as an easel, you can combine pictures into a collage that you can then use as a banner on a website, which is something that I'll be showing you how to do a little bit later. If you want to explore PowerPoint as an easel right now, though, this is a very interesting project to do. Project 2.3, Computer-Based Communication, explores a lot of social networking media, as well as other ways of putting various kinds of media onto the web. The idea here is that you take a look at what you might be interested in as far as communication in your life now or in the future when you are in your working career. And you explore these things 
and compare them in ways that I've indicated here, indicating what the possibilities might be for the utility of this form of communication in your work now and later. This is kind of interesting. If you're already familiar with some of these kinds of things, you're money ahead on this project. It's a way of exploring things also that you might not yet be aware of. Project 2.4 is of interest to a lot of people because it opens your eyes to a free product that computes with Microsoft Office called OpenOffice. This is a word processor and collection of other software that replicates what PowerPoint does, what Excel does, what the Access Database does, and it's all free. Now the story behind this is that Sun Microsystems had tens of thousands of employees and they were a competitor to Microsoft. They didn't really like the idea of paying great sums of money to Microsoft to license Microsoft Office. So they did something kind of interesting. They found a company in Europe that had programmed a replacement for Microsoft Office that is a competitor that they were attempting to sell called Star Office. They bought the company and then they made that product, which they renamed Open Office, available to all their employees. And this actually was cheaper for them than licensing the Microsoft Office. Then they decided to curry goodwill by making the product accessible to everybody in the world for free. And it's still called Open Office. And if you visit this website, you can learn about the product for both PCs and Macs, and you can download it. Interesting prospect. I've had in the past the experience that students who were not aware of this were absolutely astounded that they could satisfy their requirements for word processing and other types of personal productivity software entirely legally and free by making use of this product. If you want to do Project 2.4, what you'll involve yourself in is downloading a small file that I've given you and seeing how you might edit this file using OpenOffice. This, of course, would require you to install OpenOffice on your machine, which may not be a bad thing to do. Project 2.5 is one that you can choose if you want to explore Google Earth. In this case, you wind up moving from Chicago in its geoprocessed image on the planet Earth to some other point on Earth, and you describe for me then that other place as if you were showing me a tour. And after pointing out some notable things, then you click on the appropriate buttons in Google Earth to fly back to Chicago. Now, another interesting thing about this is you capture that tour. If you have your cell phone camera or a small flip video camera or a digital camera that has a movie mode, you just position that so that it's mostly capturing the screen that you're working with. Then you take your tour and you audio narrate it. The little video that you're creating may not have high resolution, but it's certainly sufficient to show me where you've been and for me to hear your tour. You take that video file and you upload it to YouTube. You can make it either listed or unlisted, either public or not, so that you can control who can see it if you wish. But you send me the URL so I can view and listen to your tour. And that's a rather interesting thing to do if you've been someplace that you want to point out to me or if you want to visit someplace that you haven't yet visited but have read about and want to describe various things there to me. Page 54 is the last page of required reading in the course ebook for Unit 2. I just wanted to point out that even though you're choosing only to do two projects and perhaps a third for extra credit, you do have to read what's written here about all of the projects because the upper part of every one of these assignments has information that's not duplicated elsewhere in the unit. So I do want you to read every one of these projects, which would be a good thing to do before you made a choice so that you can choose wisely. This wraps up what I'm going to show you in a preview of the reading materials for Unit 2. Take a look. If you have any questions, please feel free to text me or call me or email me. I'll be happy to answer your question as soon as possible. Have fun with Unit 2.